Welcome to this webinar uh, on which we're going to cover sustainability in retail. Uh, you'll soon hear from Steve Lister, who is the head of sustainability within Popeye. But firstly, I just wanted to uh, really give you a warm welcome on behalf of Antalis, who are hosting uh, the webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Green. I'm the uh, director for visual communications uh, within Antalis. And for those who, because it's a quite a, a wide and very varied audience, for those who don't know about Antalis, uh, we are a leading B2B distributor of uh, materials that goes into the visual communications market, the papers market, and the, uh, and the oh, no, markets. Uh, we are present globally in around 31 countries and have uh, 110,000 customers and 4,000 uh, employees. Uh, so, as I say, welcome. Uh, I'm not here particularly to say that um, uh, Antalis is perfect when it comes to sustainability. I think like most companies, we are on a journey that we're through what is ultimately a very complex uh, topic. And, you know, like, like all businesses, we are coming with the decisions whether to take, you know, what is an easy path or whether to take the right path. Uh, and there's, there's lots of questions that are revolved around that. So the one thing that we've done, uh, a few things that we've done at Antalis is, um, is to number one, to really state the direction that we want to move in. Uh, and that's done through our green manifesto. And a cornerstone of that is our, our green star system. So we, we've created a matrices really that allows us as a, as a materials distributor to rate our, our materials. And we give the, the materials one to five stars, five stars being the best materials. And that's based on the, the end of life and the recyclability, but also the raw, raw material choice, whether it's a sustainable choice or obviously whether it comes from a more uh, petrochemical uh, background. So, uh, so yeah, so we, we've used that and, and we've come out with some bold, bold statements that we're going to improve our current um, sales and our current portfolio to have 75% uh, of our portfolio three-star uh, material and above so uh, so yeah, as I say some important things other things that we've done this year uh, sorry in 2021 is, is to introduce our eco box which really gives a lot of our customers the, the selection of products that we feel are the other other sustainable products and products that we, we are looking to promote and push more applications to so I think we're on our journey, I would still say we're relatively new into our journey, like a lot of people on this call. And, you know, our motto is let's act together uh, and, you know, working with uh, industry bodies, working with our customers, we're going to learn along, along this journey. So today's session is a, an interactive one. Um, what I would say is uh, just for the, Steve's got a, quite a few slides to go through, which are very informative. If you've got any questions, if you start to put those in the uh, question section, in the chat section, uh, we'll come to those we'll Come to those at the end. Uh, but I'll now pass over to Steve. I've known Steve for a, a very long time. Uh, and the one thing I would say about Steve, he, he's very experienced in, in, in this area and he's very passionate about this area, uh, area as well. So hopefully today you'll, you'll learn a lot. I'm sure I'll learn a lot. Uh, but Steve, if you want to take it from here. Great stuff. Thanks, Chris. And, and thank you for the introduction. And thank you for Antalis for um, asking me to, uh, to present today. So I'm just going to flip over um, onto uh, my slide deck now. And so you'll probably, um, uh, uh, there you go. So just to make a point here, guys, like we said before, uh, today we're going to be talking about sustainability in retail. We're going to look at past, present and future. Now, look, I've, I've got about over 100 slides and we've got about 45, 50 minutes. Now, I'm no mathematician, but, you know, I would say that that's around about 20, 25 seconds a slide. So we're going to take a look at, first of all, who I am. Well, if you don't know me, you know, um, I've been in the industry for about 15, 20 years, uh, longer than I can care remember. But like Chris said, totally passionate about, you know, sustainability in retail and materials. I've got my own agency, which is stevelister.com, and I'm also head of sustainability for Popeye. Um, and like I said to, before, you know, over 20 years of, of looking at this materials and, 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 and stuff, you know. So for me, today's topics, we wanted to look at the year in sustainability, which was 2021, you know, of which really sustainability flourished. Um, we're going to start to take a look at the Popeye uh, temporary POS and packaging recycling report. Just a few slides just to give you some headlines in there. We're then going to sort of like look at the what's new in alternative material, what the trends are. What's in store for 2022? Some of the things that I've seen and that I think are coming to the market. 
And then we're going to look at the future of sustainability and then a live Q&A at the end. So, you know, if you've got any questions, either save them up for then, be brave, ask a question. If not, put it in the chat. But like I said, we've got a lot of slides to get through. So no sleeping. You know, this is an important uh, 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 presentation for a lot of people who've jumped on and take an interest. Come on, guys. You know, um, this is where it's going to be this year. So no sleeping and, and uh, just show a bit of interest, uh, you know, which you have done because you've joined. So if we just take a look, first of all, at um, 2021 was the year of which really I would say that sustainability in retail flourished. Now, look, I absolutely get, you know, that. Um, it was, it was, again, a tough year for retail and for brands and retailers. We know that stores are still shuttered in many, many countries around Europe and around the world. And it's been tough and it will continue to be tough. But some of the printers have been innovative and some of the shopping malls have started to put up some great graphics, you know, covering up any en empty shops. And we've seen, you know, footfall re returning, which has been fantastic for a lot of the brands and retailers. But also COVID has generated a lot of waste as well. It's generated a lot of materials that we've printed on. Brilliant for the printing industry. Been a bit challenging really also for um, the industry when it comes to sort of like recycling all this sort of stuff at the end. But if you take a, a quote from Alan uh, Joke, the CEO of Unilever, yeah, we have, despite challenging conditions, we must not turn our backs on plastic pollution. So we've got to focus on that. And also other uh, challenges that we have, and I'll run through some as well. You know, but it's not all bad news. So in, the good news is that sustainable retail is flourishing. Now, I could have spent the whole hour presenting you good news stories about what I've seen in the marketplace, but I'm just going to take some highlights. But first of all, a lot of people do ask me, well, actually, who does give a, a, a crap about the environment? Do people actually really do it? Or is there a lot of, you know, greenwashing and talk about it? And actually, that tide's turned. Um, this is a report um, done by, by Deloitte uh, last year and was updated actually from this March report over in, into new, November called Shifting Sands. And it was about consumers uh, who value uh, sustainable and ethical brands. And just you can see the graphs there, you know, 40% plus of people are now saying, consumers are saying, I want to know about waste reduction of brands. I want to know about their sustainable packaging. You know, are you reducing your carbon footprint? And are you committed to working practices? You know, this is a sea change. People are starting to ask questions. And the second part of it is people always say to me, yeah, but Steve, are people willing to pay more to support these practices and, and pay more for products? Hey, look, the report's showing that more than 50% now are willing to pay more for, for brands who are more ethical. You know, the tide has turned. People, <clears throat> people will start to move away from brands if they're not. And, and, and the final part of the report was that 45% of Gen Z, it's not really a term that I really like to use, but, you know, it's saying that the under 24 year olds have actually stopped purchasing certain brands because of their ethical concerns and their sustainable concerns for that brand. Now, that's nearly 50% of your of a major targeted audience part so that they would move away from you if you don't look after your sustainability. Now, this was an interesting one, too. So this was from the World Federation of Advertisers. So, you know, it doesn't get any bigger than this. So what they said is on the graph on the right hand side was looking at uh, CMOs, global uh, uh, marketing directors and, and, and officers within businesses. And you can see from the top graph, when they asked about their current position, sustainability came pretty much bottom of the list, you know. But when they asked the next question, which was about which will be more important in the next five years, sustainability was number one. So again, if it's coming from consumers, it will create pressure. If it's being driven by brands and retailers and companies by their marketing directors, it will also have that real push. So again, it is an absolute focus. And there's no better quote than this. You know, Sir David Attenborough said, saving our planet is now a communications challenge. And, you know, who's going to disagree with him? I, I actually think he's right. We've now got to start communicating sustainability in ways that we've never done it before. So we've got to be more transparent, we've got to be more open, and we've got to be more collaborative with our approach to tackling some of these challenges. Now, I wanted to highlight over the next few slides, really, to sort of like some of the best things that I've seen in the last 12 months. You know, Asda, you know, setting up complete store, you know, a complete store, looking at cutting out waste, you know, really challenging their thinking about reusing and single use plastics and, and reusable bottles. Look, at the moment, they're testing, trialing this. You know, are you gonna see all of these in every single store? No, you won't. 
You know, they will learn what's, what consumers want. They will adapt it as they go forward. They will put new ideas, but absolutely commend, you know, these big grocers for taking these steps and looking at this. And this will flow through across all areas of, 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 of retail where people will try and look at new things. Now, if you look at someone like the cooperative, have been huge advocates uh, of, of, of looking after farm and farmers and food welfare, you know, uh, et cetera. But now they're starting to look at their store designs, you know, and, and they're starting to now look at the materials that they use and shifting away from uh, plastics and PVCs to more recyclable, you know, fiber-based products, you know. And again, when you start to look at it, it's easy to insert, it's easy to take down, it's easy to recycle. So again, brands like, uh, retailers like Co-op, I've definitely taken that step forward to look at, look at what's happening. Marks and Spencers have just relaunched their new Plan A initiatives. They were pretty much the first major retailer that had a Plan A sustainable uh, a, a proposition all those years ago. They've just updated it. If, if you haven't seen it, go on to m and and take a look at their new commitments. You know, really great way of, of updating all, already on their commitments that they've, uh, that they've had in the past. But you can see from their stores, they're now looking at refills and refill areas, um, you know, um, and this was a little bit more, um, uh, you know, hidden away. You know, I noticed this, that Marks and Spencers have moved away from foam PVC across pretty much the, their entire estate and replaced it with a fiber based board that will go either onto slots or into channels, you know, and again, didn't make a big thing of it, just replaced it printed it and put it out into the marketplace. So again, hats off for people like m &S who can just make a change, can speak to their suppliers like Antalis, work out you know, what materials are fit for purpose, select one and then move on. Tesco's again, you know, over the last few months have announced you know, a, big, um, a big commitment around the, uh, the loop process where you, know, you buy the refillable bottles, you, know, you can take them back into store, you can refill them, et cetera. And again, their displays in store are starting to use cardboard and wood you know, on the shelving. Again, creating an overtly sustainable look so the consumers have it in their eye line that they know where these products are and knows where these brandings are so they can go and quickly uh, uh, identify them. Um, and again, Tesco's have done this whole thing where you can take back soft plastics, et cetera. Now, I'm not gonna criticize these brands for, you know, is there over packaging, et cetera. That's not why I'm one on here on today. And two, I'm not that far down the uh, supply chain, you know, but for brands to be, and retailers to be able to looking at what they can recycle and you can bring it back and strip it down. I think you can only commend them and then we can tackle the problem afterwards. Now, major uh, fashion brands like Primark, you know, this is their new wellness uh, concession inside their stores. They started this off at Box Park in London, where they were trialing different materials and how to use things and transition to more organic cottons and how you promote these in store. Yes, there's a lot of brown, less there's a lot of craft, you know, even the displays there in the middle are made from um, bales of Primark uh, 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 carrier bags, paper carrier bags. So they're thinking about it. They're thinking about how it comes across to consumers. You know, I'm not going to criticize them. Are they the most sustainable company in the world? Probably not. Are they doing something to address that? Yes, they are. And again, like I said about other brands, you sort of got to commend them for at least taking that first step into it and, and challenging themselves about how they look and feel and how they, their in-stores are, are seen. This was a beautiful uh, design uh, from Aesop in, in Australia, where one whole side of the store is made from uh, honeycomb uh, display boards. You know, again, it's, it's beautiful, it's tactile, you know, the contouring is incredible. That must be more cost effective than putting plastics and metals and glass across that one side. And at the end of this life of this, it's 100% recyclable. Just put it at the bin at the back of the store, ready to be recycled back into more honeycomb boards. So again, people are thinking about the aesthetics, they're thinking about how it connects with consumers. And you know, I for one look at this and I just wish it was closer or I wish I could visit Australia so I could go and see these types of stores. But I will do, we'll be back soon. Now Bowden at Christmas, loved this, had all these Christmas um, uh, present boxes in their stores. And I was very fortunate enough to speak to the manufacturer behind this. 
all these boxes and boards and papers, you know, were FSC, they're all recyclable at the end of life, there was a take back program, you know, so again, we might look at these displays and sometimes think, wow, this, might, this could be a bit wasteful. This was a beautiful and elegant design, which I absolutely loved, you know, which I looked at it and thought, well done, you tackled it head on, you've made it still look aesthetically, you know, absolutely pleasing but it had sustainability running through the veins of all of these des designs in, in the front of the window and in the stores. Now, Lush is another brand which, you know, is really at the forefront really of where, where they've been. And, and um, I've been in a lot of work. Um, uh, one of the, the, the other retail experts uh, out there, a guy called Ian Scott, we've been doing a lot of tours. Um, and, and Lush is one that's really up there with the way that they have their stores and displays, you know, really lovely. But I just want to touch on this. They take back a lot of their packaging, a lot of their uh, the black uh, pots. They regrind them down in uh, in Paul in Dorset, and they actually make the signs for in store from the old pots. So where you see the grass roots there on the right hand side, that display board there is actually ground old pots and made back into signage uh, boards. So again, you know they're making big strides, and companies are trying to do the right thing. You know, and even the the, the big department stores. You know, John Lewis uh, launched their Any Day product range. And all of the displays were made from sort of like uh, 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 fiber boards and fiber displays, you know, and wood panels, you know, paint over painted. And at the end of life, they'd be easily, easily recycled. So I also take my hat off to these these big brands that have got big retailers that have got huge um, uh, estates, which makes it difficult. But they, 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 I th they thought this was really well executed. Um, apologies. Um, when we go to things like uh, uh, Adidas and Converse, um, you know, there, there are brands here that, again, when they're launching, this was Converse's launch of their PET uh, uh, trainer. And again, you can see from the launch um, of this store, it's wood, it's overtly sustainable. They're using recycled materials like they should do to showcase um, uh, the product, you know, and the same with uh, 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 brands like Adidas, you know, they were launching this on Oxford Street, uh, sorry, uh, on Regent Street, and it was about plastic waste is a problem. So they can't make their displays out of plastic. So they made them out of wood. It was all FSC. It was all going to be taken back at the end and recycled at the end of the end of the uh, uh, um, uh, campaign, you know. But still, when I posted this online, there were loads of people that jumped in here and said, oh, this is, you know, you know, they shouldn't be doing this. It should be made of plastic. But you've got to think of the messaging. It was about plastic waste being a problem, and they tackled it head on by, by creating it and connecting it with these wooden displays. Now, I thought this was a neat one I saw um, only a few weeks ago. Adidas has, have now started to make some of their signage and their displays in their stores out of old recycled Adidas products. Now, this has been around for, for a while with other retailers, other brands, I'll show that in a moment. But again, when you start to look at this, you know, with tables and, and displays around the store, it connects you with the materials, it connects you with recycling, and it then connects you with, you know, uh, with Adidas's, you know, thoughts behind, you know, um, uh, different materials. Nike have done the same, you know, the, you know, Nike were the leaders in this, actually, this is where it really started with Nike with their, you know, their uh, 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 to zero campaign, you know, and they're actually you know, overtly saying it's trash, you know, this is this is what we've got in store, you know, so they're using it as an ability to be able to turn around and say, you know, here is Nike grind product and this surface is actually made from recycled products. So, you know, again, using it as a commercial uh, 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 advantage. Now, I put this up the other day. This was quite controversial. Um, uh, McDonald's first net zero uh, carbon restaurant in the UK. Now, this isn't net zero about the food and anything that's in here, you know, but they had wind turbines on the roof and solar panels. Um, the curb stones were made from recycled uh, PET bottles and, and, the, and the tiles were made from recycled elements as well. So again, these brands are doing their bit. They're trying, they're testing, they're looking at new ways to do things. And like I said, they've got to be commended um, and even the signage on the inside, that sign is there that says ground coffee was actually made from ground coffee bean board, you know, again, using waste materials from uh, McDonald's coffee grinds to make the signage. Again, it's innovative, it's new, you know, why shouldn't you do it and why shouldn't you use waste products? And I thought this was a great example. Fashion industry. They're jumping on board now. We all know about fast fashion, you know, so we're seeing it across loads of different brands now about recycling of, of, of old, um, you know, uh, 
uh, fashion items, whether it is bottles inside stores um, or whether it's actual clothing as well. So, you know, great commitment. And then the last sl slide on this piece is, you know, look, we're now looking at waste in, in, in um, you know, a, as, a, as, as a design feature. Who would have thought this a few years ago that that would be used in retail displays? So that's that first piece. Just wanted to just touch on that with you. Now, the second part of this is, you know, uh, at Popeye, you know, um, we did a groundbreaking report where we looked at waste. And this was something that we wanted to take a look about the temporary. So we went out into these places. Yes, that is me standing in the middle. It's not photoshopped of um, a lot of waste from our industry. And we wanted to understand where it was going on and how it was being recycled. So we've just launched this 36 page uh, um, report fantastic report which was sponsored by Antalis so we thank Antalis from Popeye and it also had um, uh, Linney's and HH Global who were sponsors now this was the first this was a groundbreaking research piece that we'd never done before so so you know for people um, and, and companies like Antalis uh, to stand up and to sponsor it was pretty brave and we got some great answers from it now we went out to loads of different brands and loads of different retailers, and we asked them lots of different questions. Now, I can't go through the whole of it. This, can, uh, this will be available to you afterwards if you want it. Just contact myself or Popeye or Antalis if you want a copy. You know. But here's some headlines. Well, look, you know, we asked um, uh, uh, major brands and retailers, did they have recycling targets for display and packaging? And what was quite interesting is, yes, you know, over 50% said they have, but what was more worrying was 40 odd percent plus don't have any recycling targets, you know, for them. So what happens to them at end of life at the back of store? What about driving the focus? Well, that wasn't there. You know, if we then look at leadership uh, um, and responsibilities, well, we found that there are lots of departments and there are lots of individuals um, out there who are focusing now on sustainability, which is good. And, and we're starting to see a, a trend change now of actually having people assigned to looking at this. When we then start to look at things like specifications and recycling requirements, you know, we ask questions around like, how many of your retail partners uh, have been supplied with um, recycling um, um, information? And as you can see from here, you know, the more than half don't have any information about how to recycle the stuff that we put into stores and retailers. Why not? Why isn't it put on? I don't know, you know, and that's one of the things that we, we learned from this, you know, and then we, then we asked about recycling information. Is it supplied, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, by um, uh, the manufacturing partners? Well, you can see from here that a lot of information, some is, some isn't, it's not discussed, you know, that's one thing we've got to get better at this as well. And then when we look at, uh, ask retailers about, are they aware of any materials that can't be recycled? You know, there was, you know, when you start looking at temporary, it was about 50-50 with some of the don't knows, you know, permanent. Well, no, that people just didn't know how to deal with some of these materials. So if you're in this sector, if you are making uh, displays, you've got to understand them and you've got to, you know, try and put them on, you know, and then we asked this question, you know, who's responsible at the end of life for all this temporary packaging? Well, you can see from here, you know, the retailers think it's their responsibility. Some of the brands think it's theirs, but, you know, really it's the retailers. But going back to those previous slides, if the retailers don't know what to do with it and what it's made from, how are they going to recycle it effectively? And there's a split between how to recycle things, you know, whether it's 2D or three-dimensional, you know, if you ask brands, what happens to their display materials once it's in store? Well, it's huge that they actually don't know. Now, if I was a brand, and if there's any brands on this uh, today, you should be really talking to your retail partners and asking them about what's happening to these displays. And then the final one really is, you know, the last couple of slides is, you know, what can be done to improve dis dis uh, display recycling? Well, obviously legislation, stronger designs, uh, awareness and training. So really the top tips that we got from it, I'm just going to hit, um, hit a few highlights here is, you know, you've got to avoid things like sticking stuff on and multi-layered laminates and PVC is, is under attack in lots of different areas because it's difficult to recycle. But even things like compostability and biodegradable and oxydegradable plastics can create huge issues for recycling, recycling companies, you know, and there's, there's reasons for that, that we will can maybe discuss on an, another uh, uh, webinar, you know, Inks can sometimes be a problem. Laminates, foils, glues, and plastics all actually create challenges for reprocesses and waste management companies. You know, 
you've got to try and avoid certain inks and varnishes. You know, we were told by the recycling companies, if it was only single-sided laminated, it's okay. If it's double-sided, it gives them a problem. And actually metallic films and foils could also clog machinery. So that was a big um, issue for them as well. So in conclusion for the whole report, sustainability and recycling are really important. We know that and it's only increasing. Recycling of display equipment only appears to focus, you know, who are really responsible for it. It seems that there's an unanimous belief that retailers are ultimately responsible to get rid of all this stuff. But there's sometimes a lack of understanding about the recyclability of some of these displays and, and really recycling instructions are inconsistent. So, you know, it seems that there's good intentions out there in you know, everyone on, on, on the uh, webinar here, but you've got to do more. You have to do more and overtly more. Now, the next big research project, which is coming 2022, permanent displays. We're going to start to look at permanent displays. Um, so um, that's the next big one. We'll keep you uh, posted with that. So that's the first two areas done. We've got about 20 minutes to go. Um, so this, the second and th sorry, the third and fourth areas are going to be around materials and around design. Now, historically, you know, we've worked on what's called a linear model of, of um, making stuff. You know, we've taken raw materials, we put it into factories, we've put it out to brands, we've shoved it in stores, it's gone into waste, we don't really know what to do with it, you know, and it's gone into landfill. Well, that's pretty much over now, and, and the circularity model is one which a lot of brands and retailers are now adopting, you know. Um, so we're now looking at taking those materials back through from the end of brand and, and taking them back in. I showed you examples there of Adidas, I showed you examples of, of, of Nike, who are now taking materials and making them back into retail displays. So they, this is um, something you know I saw the other day, which I thought was a great you know sort of like Mobius loop of looking at design, production, distribution, and use, and then you know recyclability and end of life, and how that can actually be a continuous loop if you make it that way. If you complicate it with some of the things we saw in the um, uh, in the Popeye report, is you know you can actually make things unrecyclable by doing some really crazy little things to them, you know, but. When you start to look at designing for circularity, you know, you know, this is just a graph to show you, you know, which has the two and which has the biggest impact. Design on the outside has the biggest impact. Then the way you procure things and produce things, less for use and end of life. Because I tell you what, if you get it wrong at the beginning, if you design it wrong and you procure it wrong, you can't really recover from it. You're gonna struggle. So just to give you a nice stat, because everyone likes a nice stat, 80% of the environmental impact of products and services are determined at the early stage of a design. If you get it wrong at the beginning, you're, you, you, you can't recover it. It's gonna be wrong all the way through, even to the point of recycling at the end, which will give people a problem. Now, people always ask this about materials and they say to me, Steve, you know, but sustainable materials are more expensive. So if we just take a look at the right-hand side first, you know, of the triangle, in the past, we just used to have a dilemma. We, the dilemma was cost versus quality. So if the client didn't have a lot of money, you could just take the quality down a little bit. But the trilemma we've got now, and that's just a word you know, I, I, I made up, um, you know, um, was really now you've got sustainability, which adds a third element in. So you've now got a balance, cost, quality, and sustainability. And that's where I said before about collaborating with you know, your supply chain partners like Antalis to balance those three things out. And you know, they've got great specification teams you know, with people like Claire White, who can actually sit down with you and actually can look at those three elements. But if we jump back to the left-hand side, um, and when people say to me, yeah, but the material costs are more expensive, so that means I've got to charge the, the client more. Well, look, you know, this isn't an exact science, you know, on the left-hand side here. We know material costs are X. We know production costs and delivery costs and margins are, you know, in there. If a, if a sustainable material goes up by 5 or 10%, the whole job does not go up by 5 or 10%. Your production costs might come down because you can produce it better. Your delivery costs might come down because it's lighter and you're saving money on delivery costs. So, you know, this is an area where you've really got to concentrate and really start to look at. And don't be blindsided by, by thinking that a, a sustainable material will cost you more, which means you're going to have to charge the client more. It doesn't always have to be that way. And that's why materials do matter. So, you know, I always get asked about trends and predictions and what's up and what's down and what's, you know. Now, look, we've got loads of materials that are coming out. You've got virgin materials and recycled and FSC. You've got fiber based and PVC and PVC free. We're now moving into things like recyclable materials and recycled and bioplastics. It's confusing. 
you know, I, I'm not sitting here thinking this is easy, guys, because it's not. But I just want to put a few predictions out there. Now, these are my predictions. OK, these aren't Antalysis. These are only going to be endorsed by, by myself, which I think, which, which, which while I uh, am seeing. Virgin and recycled fibres. There's going to be a move to recycled uh, uh, fibres uh, um, where possible. I'm seeing global brands now saying I must have at least 30 percent, at least 50 percent. And we're going to be moving to 100 percent. FSC and PEFC and other accredited materials. This is going to grow fast now due to transparency in 2022 and beyond. People will want to know where a material is from, you know, and the, and the authenticity of it and the traceability of maybe the fibres or where it, where it actually came from. Huge growth in fibre-based alternatives. We're seeing this all over the place. We're seeing different um, uh, materials now being used, but huge growth in that. Unfortunately, PVC will continue to be phased out by brands and retailers. You know, is PVC a great product? It's got longevity of life, it's cheap, et cetera. You know, but unfortunately, brands and retailers are moving away from it. What we are seeing then is PVC-free materials. There's a big focus on, on new materials, whether it's PET, whether it's recycled plastics, you know, moving down to the next one, you know, 100% recyclable really needs to be clarified. What does that actually mean? You know, if you say to someone, oh, that's 100% recyclable, well, what does it mean? You're going to have to prove that. You're going to have to start to, to, to talk about that. And it's the same with recycled plastics. These will increase as brands demand them more, but they'll also need to know what they are and, and how they're going to be recycled, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of life. Bioplastics, the jury's out, you know, on this at the moment. You know, end of life recyclability is confusing. And some big brands like Unilever, you know, are actually not even adopting bioplastics at the moment until they know more about the authenticity and the supply chain of the initial materials. Ocean plastics, expensive, but great use of, of, of clearing the oceans of plastic. Compostable plastics, they can sometimes be confusing as the claims need verifying. What is uh, a compostable? What isn't? You can't take a compostable plastic and just bury it in your garden. It has to have certain accreditations to be able to do that. And there's no doubt that closed loop materials are going to be dramatic increase in demand as we move forward. So that's just a few predictions. Some of you might disagree, you know, but it'll open up great conversation, hopefully at the end. But we are seeing big brands and retailers actually having preferred material lists, you know. So be prepared, people. If, you're, if you are, haven't looked at moving away from certain materials, your brands that you are supplying will do. They'll force you to move away from it. So you need to understand what you do, what you print on, and what your uh, uh, clients are actually moving away from. And there are now loads of different materials. So I'm just going to scoot through a few. You know, there is no doubt that fiber-based materials using water-based adhesives are the way forward. That's what people are really now focusing on. You know, we've seen some incredible uh, fiber-based materials, water-based fibers that are coming out, you know, because they're easy to use. They're easy to print onto. Um, they're easy to recycle at the end of life you know, et cetera. And if you just take Zanita board, you know, I, I visited James Beatty at, uh, at Zanita board nearly 10 years ago. We were talking about how we were going to transition people away from plastics. That was nearly 10 years ago. So companies like Z Zanita were at the forefront of making repulpable, lightweight products, you know, 10, 10 years ago, in fact, more than that. So for me, I look at brands like that and think hats off to those guys. They've really redefined the areas and now they're being adopted even more. I wanted to show you this one about you know, usability. This was a store that I passed the other day and outside was a display that was obviously end of campaign, end of life. And it was just being put in the cardboard bin outside ready for the, 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 the council to take away. Now, what better use of cardboard in a, in a display and the ease of recyclability at end of use there is no better uh, image I've seen than this, than to say, why wouldn't you move towards sort of like a honeycomb board or a fiber-based board if you can recycle it in this way? But there are now some real innovative, you know, uh, boards coming out, boards using denim and grains and coffee fibers and 100% recyclable papers, you know, they're now starting to mold these into different shapes. And again, at end of life, it's very easy to recycle these. We're getting different brands now putting different ingredients into materials. You know, you've got end of life cocoa beans and, and chocolate and, you know, and, and crushed materials. You know, there's even a company making, you know, beer paper used from old hops, you know. And, and so for me, there is innovation out there that is really pushing this forward. Um, you know, 
we've seen the scourge of coffee cups, you know, around the world. But, you know, we're now getting companies picking up these coffee cups, taking them back and recycling them into paper. You know, if I was a coffee brand or someone printing for a coffee brand, why wouldn't you use a coffee, recy a coffee cup recycled paper? I would every single time. So it's about thinking about the materials. It's about finding new materials and it's about delivering them back to your clients. I even the other day saw, which I thought was fantastic, um, a company who was making now fiber-based shrink wrap. Um, again, we're seeing some really big trends of moving away. You know, we're now seeing, um, you know, Antalis uh, of, of launching paper stick products, you know, which actually is non-plastic self-adhesive materials for windows, you know, predominantly for indoor applications, you know, not outdoor where they're going to get, you know, rained on. But that's a huge step away from um, how we used to look at materials and say, oh, self-adhesive is plastic. It doesn't have to be now. And we're also seeing things like banner materials now being made from old recycled bottles and not PVC. We're seeing poster papers now being made from upcycled materials. You know, we've now even got banner products that actually clean the air once they're out on, on side of buildings. You know, some incredible innovative products that are coming to marketplace. Plastic products like old, you know, yogurt pots being made um, into rigid plastics. You know, again, applications of coffee ta uh, tables and, and retail designs. You know, companies then taking spent material coffee beans, you know, and making them in uh, actually into either plastic sheeting products where you can mold them. And if I was a coffee shop, why wouldn't you have your trays made from old coffee beans and coffee polymers? It seems obvious, you know, but again, it's about that thinking. It's about connecting up the dots. It's about knowing about them, educating yourself about them. And even you can even have the coffee paper in maybe your menus or in your displays, you know, to again, connect you to the products. And we're seeing some other innovative ways, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, shells from 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 the ocean. You know, we're even now seeing denim as, as waste products now going into displays. Again, if I was a fashion brand, I'd be using these products in my in-store displays, you know, tomorrow if I could. And now the big brands like Nike are even looking at all of their waste products in their manufacturing, putting it back into different products and extruding it, and even using it into things like, you know, court design. And, and this um, uh, basketball court was made from 20,000 pairs of used uh, uh, products. So again, people are looking at circular design and waste products more than they ever have. The plastics industry is starting to take notice. People are starting to take a look at things like Corex or fluted polypropylenes, how they take it back and recycle it back into itself. You know, this was a company down in um, Australia who now have recycling bags for print waste for, uh, for both stores and uh, uh, manufacturers. So they can put small volume or large volume bags, fill it up and for them to be taken away and recycled. So people are starting to tackle the problem at different areas. And it, like uh, Chris alluded to at the beginning, you know, Antalis have, have, have really tackled this head on with their Green Star system. If you haven't seen this, go in and take a look at it or speak to uh, uh, to Claire or anyone at the Antalis team, you know, some great ways of, of being able to have a scoring system for products. Again, educating yourself, not just for papers, but for visual communication products, you know, of where, you know, you can really start to educate yourself and educate your clients about the different materials that you've used and why you've used them, because that's important too. Um, the display box that they send out is fantastic as well. A bit of a geek when it comes to this sort of stuff, but uh, it's just really educational and for informative. So, I, you know, I will take my hat off. You know, I'm not being paid for today. You know, I'm doing it because, you know, Antalis are a forward thinking company who want to educate their consumers and educate the industry. And this is a great way to do it. So if you haven't got one of these boxes, definitely get one. It's a fantastic way to educate yourself. And, you know, really, this is just a quote, last piece here about, you know, a quote from Jonathan Porritt, who was the co-founder of Forum for the Future and also Greenpeace. Look, there, there's not many industries that can really inherently say that they're sustainable. The paper industry is one of them. So if you get challenged about paper cutting down trees, you know, it's inherently sustainable and inherently, you know, a, a, a great industry with great products. So last five sort of like uh, near 10 minutes of this is, you know, so people keep asking, well, what's in store for 2022? Well, sustainability is going to continue to dominate our, dis our uh, displays, you know, and our signage, you know, and people are already starting to be innovative about the materials that they use. I saw this from P&G and, uh, and Lidl, where these new displays are made from um, what's called a, a selfie paper. You know, this is a high fast 
you know, growth product that can be made into fibers. You know, so again, people have been innovative about the materials that they use. You know, they're using less ink on these displays and they're 100% recyclable at end of life. We saw this with Mars Wrigley, the one on the left-hand side here. This is actually made from, um, you know, coffee bean board. There's also 100% recycled paper boards now that you can buy. Blurring the lines now between temporary boards made from cardboard and semi-permanent displays, which are more rigid. Unilever, another great company, a company I've worked with for many years, had the privilege of working um, with them and Indicia Worldwide. You know, they're starting to now look at displays which are more modular. They can be repacked at the end of life. They can be recladded at the end of life. You know, saving money, saving time, saving space. You know, and other brands who are really starting to look and be innovative, you know, around, you know, can we reclad things and maybe not throw the carcass away every single time, but maybe what we do need to do is maybe just send out the header board and the side panels or the front of it rather than the carcass every single time. And we are seeing this already. Um, so if you don't think you're, you're seeing it, you will see it. There is some innovations out there. This is from Barrows in South Africa, where they've taken uh, Tetra Pak um, uh, cartons, um, melted them down and made display panel, uh, uh, dis uh, displays in store. So the carcass is going to stay there for, for many, many months, if not years. And all they do is reclad the outside of it. You know, again, in, in, in a fiber based product, reduces weight, reduces volumes, reduces cost. So again, they're, they're innovating in all areas. And I love this example from Kellogg's. The Kellogg's team, you know, have started to look at putting, you know, statements on their FSDUs, their freestanding display units, saying that they're recyclable at the end of life. They're made from cardboard. So not just educating the consumer, they're educating the store staff about what to do with them at end of life. So, you know, hats off to people like Kellogg's and the Pringles team for that as well. So what is the future for displays and those things? Well, look, you know, You've just got to look at swapping out maybe you know plastic for cardboard. You've got to change the flutage maybe to make it lighter, replace hooks, make it more modular. You know maybe put slots rather than gluing, and maybe select more carbon neutral products. And just to give you an example here, you know just by going really from D flute to a B flute, you can save in, and reduce by about twenty six percent. You know again you're saving on materials, you're saving on on transport costs. So again, it doesn't have to be more expensive by making a small change. And you can see some of the reductions you can have in CO2 when it starts to, to focus you on you know, modular designs, different eco, how you've made it, and optimization as you ship. So some big reductions. This was something that I, I've been seeing a lot of just lately is people are also moving towards slotted wooden displays or slotted fiber displays that can be put up very quickly, maybe uh, are in store for longer, you know, um, and the Valley Group have been doing some great work in, in seeing these slotted display systems out there that uh, blur the line between temporary and semi-permanent. And also in Europe, you know, I haven't seen these in the UK, but there are now companies putting displays out there which are collapsible, you know, um, that are more than semi-permanent. These are really sort of like permanent displays, but just need to be clad on the outsides. And they're making claims around 90% reduce uh, reduction of cardboard and CO2. But there are also downsides to these as well. You know, you know, we, we, you know um, the retailers have to buy them or rent them. They have to store them in different places. So with every benefit, there is also sometimes a bit of a negative. So always do your homework and always explore what's out there. So the last few slides leading us up into the last sort of like 10 minutes of Q&A. So if you haven't got a question already, just try and think of what I've done over the last you know, slides and, and think of something that you've always wanted to ask. So people always say to me, Steve, well, what is the future of sustainability then in, in retail with brands and retailers? You know, what is the direction? Now, the journey, like Chris said at the beginning, is, you know, it's a it's a it's not an overused X factor one, but you know, what is the journey? Because we've all been on it. Well, for me, I look at it and think it really sustainability is about education, it's about data. And this year, you you are going to be asked more and more, and this is carbon quota of saying it's a lot of common sense here, but you will be asked more and more about CO2. You know, can you manage it? If you can't manage the CO2 and, and me measure it, you can't manage it. If you can't manage it, you can't reduce it. So you're going to get challenged this year. So, you know, just a couple of other stats for you, you know, and this is from Carbon Quota. You know, 100% recycled poly property, polyprop, can't even say it, you know, has a 61% lower carbon footprint than Virgin. So if you're tasked with lowering footprint, you've got to go to recycled. 
And this was an interest, interesting one. Did you know that carbon footprint of a ton of 100% recycled polyprop is similar to the to same as lipo grade papers? So again, it's all about understanding. It's all about education. And Carbon Quota are doing some great stuff about carbon footprinting of displays and signage. And it's about education and understanding. And it's the same with Popeye. Popeye have got the sustain tool. If none of you have seen it, go on to Popeye and have, take a look or contact me afterwards. You know, this is where we're really ending up now. We're looking at you know, products uh, uh, that can be uh, measured. You know, so giving you an education around what can be done and how can you reduce it. You've got other brands out there who are now looking at optimization of their supply chains, you know, helping customers make informed decisions. So again, you know, different marks. And we're seeing things like sustainable IDs being put onto products now, um, you know, where you can measure where they've come from. And Climate Neutral are doing some great stuff with connecting, you know, the CO2 uh, of products and putting it back into and onto displays so you can click on the QR code and educate yourself. So again, the future really of, of, of that is transparency. You know, you will be challenged now about how transparent you are about the materials that you use, what's their carbon footprint, you know, um, where the products come from, and you've got to up your knowledge. You know, you will be challenged more in 2022 than you ever have before. You know, yes, it's daunting, but you have got partners like Antalis, like Popeye, like myself, and there are some other, some, you know, many more great, you know, experts out there who can help you on your journey. But I just want to leave you with one final thought. Not everything in the future can be brown paper and craft and wrapped up in string. Maybe the future of sustainability in retail, retail design with brands and retailers is more embedded sustainability. It's in there, it's more elegant, it's hidden, but it's in there. Not everything we can put out into stores will look like this, which will be brand, you know, brown with just a brand name over the top of it. I think the sustainable future is embedded sustainability where the materials and the designs have been thought about up front and you just know it's in there. You, you can clearly demonstrate it if you have to. And there's some wonderful examples out there. I'll leave you with these last two slides. Is Unilever launched this new refill system for their de deodorants. And again, the packaging was all FSC. It had the minimal amount of print on. It wasn't laminated. There was no plastic parts on the inside. And again, it's about elegant design and it's about you know, embedding sustainability into products right at the beginning, eliminating what you can, lightweighting where it's possible, but having that transparency of material, which guarantees its sustainability moving forward. So I rattled through those slides. Some people were probably doubting that I would get through that many slides, but uh, as people know me, I, you know, it's an important subject and a subject I'm, I'm absolutely passionate about. So that's where we are, you know. Um, is there any questions? I, I could take a little look in the uh, in, into the chat, but what I will do is I'll stop sharing my screen here. But last little bit, sorry, just quickly. Um, if there are contact details afterwards, speak to me direct or speak to Antalis. But get in touch with people like Claire White, who's specifications consultant at Antalis. You know, and they will be able to help you. So. Thank you very much indeed. I am going to stop sharing my screen now, if I can, and then back over to Chris. Steve, uh, really interesting. Uh, some, I think the one thing that stands out to me is the innovation side and where we're going. You know, I think, I think, as I say, directionally, I think we all know where, where we need to go, but the innovation side of it is critical. And that's not just in innovation in the end use application. It starts at the at the manufacturing point and coming that coming through, and I think what I what I would say is you know I, I manage the supply chain uh, for visual communications within Antalis, and there is absolute focus from manufacturers you know in, in terms of introducing new products that that drive that sustainability element, which is which is always positive to see. So, so thank you very much, Steve. That that's fantastic. We do have some questions. 
Yeah, I'm, I can just jump onto a few as well for yeah. you there, because um, uh, Ian Scott has just uh, jumped on as well. Um, Ian Scott has just been voted uh, one of the retail uh, experts and influencers for 2022. If you want to know more about uh, retail innovation, go and, go and uh, visit Ian Scott on LinkedIn. Um, but he's made a good point here. Lush will now give you guided tours of their Oxford Street store and explain their sustainable approach. Wow, great information, Scott. Uh, if you're passing uh, in London, definitely go in and get a guided tour. I would, I'm going to, I'm, next time I'm down there. Thanks, Ian, for that. Um, Peter, um, what's the difference between FSC and PEFC? Well, they're just a different accreditation, aren't they, Chris? Yeah, yeah. So ultimately, I think FSC was the first, uh, and um, they initially only covered the kind of subtropical sub sub uh, forestry. Uh, and that introduced them PFC that that then covered the kind of European forests and, and the American forests. So ultimately trying to do the same thing. I think is it uh, uh, I think people's perception that one is better than the other, in my opinion, is unfair. But, you know, obviously, hey, just the comments on as well. Yeah, Chris, just to throw another stat out, there's over 450 eco labels around the world in, in 199 countries. It's confusing, you know, to do your homework. Look at the right ones for your country and adopt them where you uh, where you can. There was another question about paying more and about people, you know, balk at paying more. I think I, I touched that one about, you know, the dilemma you face with sort of like balancing cost versus uh, uh, quality versus sustainability. Challenge it. Speak to your suppliers. Speak to Antalis if, if you know, hey, look, it's a, it's a two way. It's a partnership. If, if, if something you think is expensive, maybe you can buy more of it and negotiate a price decrease. Hey, look, I'm not saying you can do that for Antalis, but you might be able to make forward commitments and commitments on volumes, which might be able to help you. So it's not just you, you, you've got to collaborate with partners like Antalis. I think just a, just my commentary on that as well, Steve, is have I just given away a discount there, Chris? Well, there's always discount, but, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, I, I think, you know, we're in a time just at this moment and certainly over the last year where, you know, global inflation on prices, you know, we've seen prices certainly rocket and particularly on, on, on polymer based products as well. Yes. But the, the one thing I would say is, um, you know, we, we've been looking at you know products for over over 10 years when we're talking about sustainable. We are now at that tipping point where I can I can hand on art say some of the sustainable options now are cheaper than the standard options. Yeah, they are, aren't they? And and that's you know that's probably the first time that, that we've been able to say that you know so you know we, we've had a, a couple of introductions uh, of new product ranges in our bubble board like Triaprint where you know we've seen a fantastic response on that product and and as I say it, it, the, the economy the economy and the commercial elements around it are actually beneficial to move to that product so you know that's a, that's a really good point there uh chris because I, I you know i didn't want to say it because obviously i don't know your pricing structures but i you know it's easy, and it's an easy thing for me to say and i'm glad you said it is people will be surprised that there are sustainable alternatives that are either at price parity or lower mm. so so don't immediately think so if i just uh, uh, jump to another question greg hepburn asked about um you know, is there going to be, is the importance of materials and is there a focus on research on, on waste management? Hey, Greg, there are huge companies working on recycling of plastics and, and, and fibres and stuff like that. So I think we're, we're going to see an increase of innovation when it comes to waste management um, moving forward. So and I hope that um, I hope that uh, answers that question. Um, Another question around uh, 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 Daniel Screen asked around a question is, is about design and manufacturers and FSDs and POS. You know, um, hey, look, you know, you've, what you've got to do, uh, uh, Daniel, is you've got to select the right material. He's asking about the right materials and about laminating and, you know, can things like perfume damage products? Yes, it can, you know, but that's where you get to the cost, cost, quality, functionality, sustainability. You can't select a product that, in, in the end, it's going to be functionally, you know, inferior because you don't want anything falling off it or de degrading. So you still have to use those metrics of you've got to use the right product. You've, I think you've just got to educate yourself with the right one and, and how it can be recycled at the end. All I will say is, is just don't complicate stuff. Don't laminate stuff on stuff. Don't screw things into things that then can't be easily disassembled at the end of life. Just think about the whole design process. Remember that stat I gave you at the beginning? 80% of the sustainable impact is at the beginning of the, of the process. So if you get it wrong there, you get it wrong all the way through. 
Um, when do you think uh, brands and retailers can push local councils and governments to improve the recycling schemes? Great question, Nicola. Hey, look, that's going to be outside my remit here. One of the, the, the challenges we've got here is the recycling strategies around the world have got to catch up the materials. And the problem we've got is we've got a lot of waste and we're struggling to keep up with it with our recycling. You know, councils will catch up. They'll have to. Local governments will have to catch up. You know, governments, continents, you know, will have to deal with the waste problem. And where there's money to be made, there will be innovation. And waste is money. It's a resource these days. You can't just throw it away. There's lots of people making a lot of money from waste. You know, so there will be more and more innovation out there, Nicola, as we move forward. Um, we've got three minutes. Um, can you make any suggestions for online packaging and retailers? Can we learn to balance product? Hey, look, if you're online, we've seen some stuff. I've been posting stuff on LinkedIn where I've received something online from certain companies. I'm not going to name them now, you know, where I've opened the box and they've got 23 sheets of plastic and paper and bubble wrap and boxes and tape and whatever. Those companies have got to learn. Do you name and shame them? Hey, look, I've done that. You know, why shouldn't you? You know, um, if that instigates change, well, that's the way it's got to be, you know, and, and we've got to do that. Um, Steve, we, we've also got some questions on the Q&A. OK, go for it. So, so yeah, so um, just uh, obviously uh, uh, we've had a question, just one, uh, how do we um, obtain the eco box? So that's probably for me. So just if you leave your details with us, uh, we can get one of those sorted out. Uh, other things, uh, there is a challenge in the recycling world to find companies who actually recycle these new combination materials, such as yep. cotton board, denim boards, etc. Uh, what do you see from your perspective? I, I agree. There, there are there. Are, there's there's lots of companies now looking at commingled waste and waste that is actually multiple polymers and and stuff. That's gonna that's very very interesting um, to do. Um, I, I would say the difficulty we have with some of them is if you make them too complicated, they can only ever go back into themselves. They can't be made into a third party product. So that is going to be a challenge um, to make sure that that's what people do. Steve, a question from Brom. Um, uh, obviously, we focus on mainly on the UK. Uh, do you see these trends happening globally uh, in Europe, Asia, US, and who's leading that? Uh, yeah, Bron. Hey, look, nice to speak to you, Bron. Bron's one of these experts that I've known for probably twenty odd years, and, and you know, Bron's at the the, the forefront of, of looking at this. So it's a great question as well from him. Yeah, I think all um, trends. We we get trends back from Europe. We take trends into Europe. Um, America's a little bit slower to adopt some of the things, but they're catching up. Um, hey, look, the Far East is is in front of us when it comes to recycling. Hey, the last twenty two years we've been shipping all of our waste plastic over to China and they've been recycling it. You know, they haven't been landfilling it. So there are different continents which are ahead in certain ways and behind in other. So I definitely, you know, I've shown you a few there about things like. Um, some of the displays that we've seen in Europe will come back to, uh, to the UK. We're definitely seeing other trends, you know, we'll definitely see you know, them transferring from continent to continent. So thanks, Bron. Uh, and a question from Martin, uh, just referencing the uh, Tesco's preferred materials list. And the yeah. question, sustainability design by fault, uh, consumers aside, it seems to be a revolutionary that is predominantly being led by retailers at the moment. Do you agree? And then are there un any other uh, big retailers and groups, example, John Lewis, Curry's, et cetera, having similar POS requirements? Um, a great question, Martin. Um, and, and, and yes, you know, uh, you know, look, Tesco's, if I dug around everyone's sustainability strategies on their websites, I probably would find more. I even found one yesterday for a client I was doing some sustainability consultancy for. So, so absolutely, we are now seeing, you know, these preferred lists. And like I said, with the research, once brands and retailers are educated more, they'll start to put these demands back onto agencies, design agencies, manufacturers, print suppliers, you know, and then back to companies like Antalis, who are the materials distribution companies around the world. So it will flow up and it will flow down. But Martin, definitely we will see a greater focus on these, you know, lists of materials are either preferred or they want to move away from. And look at that, we finished on time. Good. Chris, so yeah. hey, look, I'm just gonna end up one thing before you say goodbye. Thanks everyone for listening. Look, you know, um, 
most of you stayed. There was only a few people dropped out, even at the end there. I know we've gone over a minute, but thank you for, for attending. Any questions, please get back to your Antalis team, um, Claire White or Chris, you know, or Nicholas over in, um, uh, in, in Europe, or myself, either through Popeye or via stevelister.com. Thanks, yeah. Chris. No problem. Thank you very much, Steve. As I say, re really interesting. And obviously, we, we, we've recorded this session. So for those who did turn up late, uh, then obviously, you, you'll get a copy of this if you uh, reach out to us. Also, if there are any unanswered questions or more questions raised from this, please, once again, send, send those through uh, and we can get those answered. But just a big thank you. Uh, I know, uh, obviously, time is always important, but this is a very important subject. Uh, and I hope you've all found it as useful and informative than, than what I've done. So thank you very much indeed. And take care and have uh, a, a good journey on, on your sustainable journeys. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you.